I was also really struck in the reading of this foundational paper that, that talks about the doing and the being mm. in a relationship to who we are as ministers, leaders, and priesthood. And oftentimes, uh, we equate our faithfulness with how much we're doing and how much energy and time we place in the doing. But in this foundational paper, it makes it very clear in order for us to truly experience the love that God has for us and then our response to that love and the way in which we minister, that we need to take the time to intentionally be in the presence. Yes. And so I want to ask you a personal question. We have all of us are ministers that struggle with that balance between the incredible need that we see as we serve and then the also intrinsic, intentional need to be close uh, to our, our God. And so how do you personally balance between the doing and the being in God's love? Well, I've been a priesthood member for about 40 years of my life. And the lesson I have to keep learning over and over and over again is that the most effective ministry that I offer comes out of the overflow of my own encounter and experience with, with God's grace and God's love. When I'm not doing that, ministry just becomes more of going through the motion, uh, task, checklist of things to do. And that too easily leads to uh, burnout or cynicism about ministry in our own lives and decreasing effectiveness. Even though we may be very active, we may be very busy, but it's not um, offering the kinds of ministry and blessings that the people in the congregation or the mission center or the field really stand in, in need of. There's a good story in the Bible that I return to time and time again to remind me about the importance of the being side. And that's the story of Elijah in the book of 1 Kings. Elijah was a prophet's prophet, and he was doing mighty prophetic acts. And he found himself eventually being hunted down by Queen Jezebel, who said that she was going to take his life. And all of a sudden, he was disoriented. And so he went into the wilderness. Now, in the scriptures, the wilderness is always symbolic or speaking about either the need for solitude or the call to solitude, to be with God in one's own inner being. So he goes into the wilderness. He's exhausted physically and spiritually. He's afraid. He's anxious. And he sits down under a broom tree and, and basically says, it's all over. Says to God, take my life. It's all over. It's nothing. I can't live like this. And then he goes to sleep. Now there's a good point. <laughs> Sometimes what we need most is to sleep. I was thinking about that this morning. Yeah, what time? <laughs> about 3.30 when I woke up. <laughs> he goes to sleep, and in a moment of grace, in that solitude, when he's on the edge, a messenger of the Lord, an angel comes to him and taps him on the shoulder and says, you need to eat some bread and drink some water because the journey has become too great for you. Now that's the phrase that really speaks to me. But not just to me, but I think to leaders in the church, priesthood ministers, 
uh, at every level of the church's life, it's all too easy for the journey to become too much for us. And so he's being nurtured by God's grace and God's generosity. And not only does that occur once, but it occurs twice, as if to say one retreat or just one <laughs> break is never enough. But the angel says again, eat some bread and, and drink some water, which of course are highly symbolic of the spiritual life. The journey is too great for you. And, oh, water. Well, thank you. <laughs> and uh, all of that becomes prelude to a continued journey where he goes further into the wilderness, he dwells in a cave, so he's going deeper. And then he has experiences with God that he hadn't had before. And he finds God in, a, in an inner, still, small voice. And then all of that becomes prelude to all of the ministry, all of the prophetic activity which was to follow. So I always remember that phrase, the journey has become too much, too great for you. And so more and more, I'm taking time to be quiet, to be still, to do things that I like to do that I know renew and refresh me. I draw on daily meditations that come to me <laughs> via the internet, but I have the discipline of doing the meditation before I get to all of the other emails. I took all of my vacation this year, and I may sneak a few more days in after the peace colloquy. Good for you. Um, see if the fish are still biting. <laughs> um, prayer time in quietness and stillness with a lot of listening has become even more frequent in my life. So, yes, being is just as important as doing in ministry. Because if I'm not being, and by that means if I'm not abiding or immersing myself in God's love and God's Spirit, the journey will become too great for me. And then my ministry will just be activity with little real effect in the life of the church. God put Sabbath in the cycle of human life. And that means rest and accept that you are fully accepted when you're not doing anything. That's the concept of Sabbath. To rest in God's love frees us to incarnate or to enflesh Christ's passion and concern for all people. And then it's out of the overflow of that that we minister. And then ministry becomes a joy. It's very meaningful and it connects. Yes. It also helps us better connect with Christ's mission because when we love to the degree that we can like God loves, then we have this wonderful sense of call into Christ's whole mission. And so as we talk about Christ's mission, explain to us how that is our response of faithfulness to God's nature, will, and purpose for all of creation. Well, we believe that Jesus Christ is the embodiment of God's nature, will, and unfolding purposes in creation. So we can look to Christ to understand more clearly what that is. And so this is the connection again, theologically, foundationally, where do we see the clearest expression of Christ's understanding of God's nature and will and unfolding purposes? It's when Christ, as is recorded in Luke 4, we've already heard this morning, uh, proclaims His understanding of mission as His personal calling 
That is revelation to us about God's nature, God's purposes, God's priorities in creation. And Jesus speaks about evangelism, proclaiming good news, compassionate ministries that that heal the brokenhearted and the despairing, and then justice and peacemaking ministries, especially with the phrase to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We study that in the scriptural context. We understand that that's the time of God's realized justice on earth as it is in in heaven. So when we focus on that mission as disciples and as members of the priesthood, we are right in the center of expression of God's nature and God's purposes as revealed in the life and ministry of of Jesus Christ. And that's why we continue to emphasize the mission initiatives because they align us and they focus us And they help us avoid not just giving attention to one aspect of God's nature or one aspect of Jesus' ministry that particularly appeals to us or that's most related to our interests and giftedness. It pushes us to always be looking at all the dimensions of Christ's mission and ministry in the world. And that's good for us as disciples, as leaders, as priesthood. It's good because it makes for healthy congregations that are truly aligned with God's will, nature, and purposes. Yes, and as ministers, all three of the mission initiatives to invite people to abolish poverty and suffering and pursue peace on earth, those are all connected in very important ways. We, we don't just do one and not the other. Right. In fact, we do them all, all the time, daily in our lives. All three were, were, are, were actually focusing on Christ's mission as we live all three out daily. Yeah. The, the danger of identifying three is yes. that people begin to separate them or they think it's a list of choices. Yes. And if we do that, we've truncated the gospel. What we're presenting is not a full understanding of Jesus' mission or God's purposes in the world. Yes, and all people, by our very enduring principles, all are called in the worth of all persons. So we're all called into Christ's mission. Specifically, some are called to serve in priesthood for specific roles and responsibilities. And in the past, I must admit, I think we have thought of it as an individual pursuit as priesthood. It's my ministry, called by God, my ministry. But in this foundational document, there's a real emphasis on working as a team of servant ministers, which really excites me as I think about the impact, not only in congregations, but into the world. Can you talk about that idea? Rather than being individualistic about our priesthood, think about our priesthood as a team of members serving as servant ministers. And this concept is especially important in our Western cultures because we know that one of the characteristics of the time in which we live in Western cultures is is, uh, rampant individualism. It's all about me, and that immediately becomes a danger in ministry. So this was an aha moment for us. We've been talking about God's in-community and for-community nature. Our name is community of Christ. We see how Jesus promoted, encouraged, birthed communities of inclusiveness. And then we tend to view ministry in individual terms. What doesn't fit there? So all of those concepts say to us that the in-community and for-community nature of God applies to ministry and priesthood. No one has all the gifts, all the insights, all the energy, all the experience to provide the ministry that's needed in the life of the church and in the world. 
So this concept of ministry in teams, and especially among those uh, offices of the priesthood where there are some complementary and overlapping purposes, is very important. It's almost as if, if we follow through again, God's in-community nature for community, that in community of Christ, the very concept of priesthood in the various offices assumes that we're going to be working together in community <laughs> as ministers. So the whole notion of it's all about me as an individual minister, and that has no relationship to the church or as community, just doesn't make sense, and it doesn't hold up, and it's not consistent with these foundational uh, understandings that are provided in the paper. Paul's analogy of the body of Christ continues to speak. And it's not just about the nature of the church. It's also about the nature of relationships among the various priesthood members and priesthood offices in the church. And one cannot say to the other, I have no need of you. We have mutual need for all of those ministries to be working constantly in the life of the church for the body of Christ to be alive and vibrant and dynamic and effective. Yes, and, and even as you're speaking, I'm going back to what you had said about the doing and the being. So I even sense in this foundational paper a call for that team of servant ministers to be very intentional as a team to spend time in scripture study being. and worship and prayer and in being. Yeah. Well, we, again, when we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, he had this cycle. Um, be in solitude, be with God alone. And that's where I get to know myself. My best self, my shadow self, <laughs> in solitude with God. But then Jesus always moved into community with his disciples. And then it was from out of community that there was movement into effective ministry that was literally world-changing ministry. And that cycle occurred throughout the uh, time of Jesus' life and ministry on earth. And we see him saying, you know, we need to go away for a while. We need to renew. There was time in community. And then there was ministry but there was always the coming back to solitude, quality community, because we are spiritually formed as individuals, but we're especially spiritually formed in relationship to others in community. And then out of that, moving into ministry. 